to uh, start us off. I'm a Facebook friend with Professor Allen. I'm going to be a lot more careful from now on. Um, so uh, uh, I'm uh, Nick Terry from uh, Indiana University School of Law. Uh, where I'm the Hall Render Professor of Law. You've got all of our bios. I'm not going to waste time introducing people. They're going to yeah. say who they are and where they work, or in some cases, the place in the multiple <laughs> jobs they have, uh, so as to maximize the time we have for, uh, for questions. Um, so this panel focuses on technologies operating outside of HIPAA. I feel I'm echoing. Am I echoing terribly? No? no? Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, so, for those of you who view HIPAA and health information privacy as synonymous, that may seem a somewhat odd topic. Uh, so let me try and frame the issues from a legal perspective to start things rolling. Uh, three broad points. First of all, U.S. data protection operates on what we call a sectoral or domain-specific basis. Can you speak into your microphone? Am I not speaking into the microphone? Be able to hear online. Is that better? Yes. All right. U.S. data protection operates on a sectoral or domain-specific basis. At neither the federal nor the state level do we have a powerful unitary or universal data protection regime. Rather, we regulate by individual domain. For example, the Graham Leach Biley Act uh, governs uh, 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 consumer privacy in the financial sector. Uh, the Reagan era Video Privacy Protection Act of uh, 1988 keeps safe your dodgy choice of videotape rentals, if you still do that sort of thing. Um, those different domains not only bring different uh, substantive rules, but they also drive process and regulation. So these different domains are uh, looked after by different regulatory agencies. So for example, the Graham uh, Leach Biley Act is jointly regulated by SEC, FTC, and a bunch of banking regulators. Um, GINA, for example, the Genetic Privacy Act, is regulated by EEOC and so on. Um, if any agency has generalized powers, it's the FTC. Um, but typically, we have fairly narrow domain-based uh, domain protections. Now, there are several negatives associated with a system like that. Uh, the one that's most important for today's purposes, I think, is that data likes to be free. And when you have multiple domains, data will tend to flow to the least regulated domain. The second broad point, U.S. data protection favors what we call downstream models, or at least what I call downstream models. Mm. Downstream models operate after data has been collected. In contrast, upstream models of data protection tend to constrict or control the data from being collected. Uh, privacy is an upstream model. Uh, confidentiality is a downstream model. Uh, confidentiality regulates how and when data may be uh, uh, disclosed. It doesn't uh, regulate how it may be protected. Uh, hence, one of US, uh, uh, US law's great uh, uh, privacy ironies is that the privacy rule, the HIPAA privacy rule, is not a privacy rule. It's a confidentiality rule. It doesn't stop data being collected. Third, uh, privacy. Uh, confidentiality and HIPAA privacy are all what lawyers call liability rules. That is, in a particular context, typically a relationship, if someone breaches one of those rules, they will be liable in some way to the data subject. Now, in that common law, in tort law, that might give rise to a damage claim. HIPAA is no different, except we have vested the liability uh, rights in a regulatory agency, as two U.S. Uh, two New York hospitals found out a couple of weeks ago, to the tune of five uh, million dollars. Um, liability rules don't scale very well. They tend to fall apart when there aren't obvious relationships to be identified, uh, when relationships aren't transparent. Um, some people, therefore, argue for a property rule or a quasi-property rule, such as the right to be forgotten or the right of erasure. Um, 
A property rule or a quasi-property rule is not dependent on relationships. It flows with uh, the data. Uh, and uh, that distinction between liability rule and property rule is important. So those and other limitations in HIPAA um, have been noted in the hundreds of thousands of words eviscerating uh, HIPAA privacy and security, many of which I'm proudly uh, 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 responsible for. Um, they've pub been published by both privacy advocates and by those who are regulated by HIPAA. Notwithstanding, for the last 13 or 14 years, we've been able to say that HIPAA security and privacy protects most of our health data most of the time. Maybe not always very well, and occasionally leaking the very data we thought was protected. But overall, HIPAA would be in play with regard to our health privacy. That reality no longer exists. A few days ago, the PCAST report on big data and privacy technologies noted the following quote. The conflict between privacy and new technology is not new, except perhaps now in its greater scope, degree of intimacy and pervasiveness. For more than two centuries, values and expectations relating to privacy have been continually reinterpreted and rearticulated in light of the impact of new technologies. Think back 15 years ago. Why did we have HIPAA privacy and security? Because we knew the health industry was about to engage in a new round, a brand new world of data interchange, primarily for transactional purposes, and so we put in HIPAA. We now face completely different technologies, technological capabilities, and use cases. By accident or by design, data held by data brokers, health data stored on your mobile phone, and data downloaded using the blue button fall outside of HIPAA protection, or have an indeterminate status that makes uh, regulation difficult. So uh, we need new policies, new ideas, and new thoughts. And that's what this panel is going to provide you. So Frank, I think you're next. Oh, thank you so much, Nick. That was just a fantastic introduction. And it is great to be here. Um, I consider both Deb and Nick uh, incredibly cutting edge thinkers. Uh, they spotted this issue way before it was on most people's radar screen. It was fantastic to be there. And I think, um, and thanks so much, Professor Allen, for a, a talk today that I think is really cutting edge and spotting issues that are going to become a big part of ethics 5, 10, 20 years from now. So my talk will focus on one question that I hope we can all think about through the course of this presentation and the day. And that is, do we want to live in a world where people have a body score that is as important, as precisely calculated, and as pervasive as their credit scores? Okay. And this, I think, is a world which we are entering into right now. And I say this not just because of the extraordinary revelations that were put forward in a series of five reports over the past eight months, the Rockefeller Senate Committee Report on Data Brokers, Pam Dixon and Bob Gelman's incredible report called The Scoring of America, which revealed that health scores presently do exist and are being used. The Federal Trade Commission's report just a few days ago on data brokers, uh, sort of extraordinary achievement uh, arising out of the December 2012 subpoenaing of nine data brokers uh, records, finally an effort to uh, sort of disclose what the people who know all about us um, what we can know about them, the PCAST report that Nick just mentioned, and the White House Big Data report. You put these five reports together, um, along with some journalistic uh, interventions, and you have a sea change in our understanding of the nature of health data and the way it's collected, analyzed, and used about each of us. Let me give you some concrete examples. Um, one credit card company, when it learns that users are going into marriage counseling, has discovered a correlation between marriage counseling and defaults. So it knows that's a trigger. We have a record that you went into marriage counseling, raise the interest rates, lower the credit limits. Um, there is a company that has takes track of things that you might be interested online when you're filling out forms, doing searches, etc. So uh, Natasha Singer of the New York Times documented that someone, when a friend, a friend of hers uh, looked about some information about a friend of hers that had MS online, and this went to a lead generating company and another data broker and another data broker that ultimately put her on a list for an MS interest group and she was invited to MS discussion groups by a pharma company. Um, we know that certain data brokers are uh, compiling lists of diabetic concerned households. 
What I think is particularly fascinating about a diabetic concerned household is how this data collection and characterization of individuals interacts with First Amendment law. So let's say that I went and I don't have diabetes, but I tried to go to a data broker and say, hey, wait a second, I'm not diabetic. Oh, no, 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 they might say. We have characterized you as diabetic concerned mm -hmm. and unfalsifiable opinion. Okay? So, <laughs> so what we're seeing, uh, and, and all of the, there are so many streams of data that are feeding into these types of things. Um, for example, we have the Internet of Things, which has generated things like a sleep pillow. So you use apps to maybe keep track of how well you're sleeping, how often you toss and turn. At what point will the sleep pillow sort of tell, perhaps, or suggest whether the person is sleeping with someone else? Um, and we have M Health apps that are really proliferating. And we have reports, of course, from the FDA and others, the FIDESIA report on health IT, other reports that are starting to get their head around these things. But, you know, if you look at Scott Peppett's excellent article on regulating the Internet of Things that's coming out in the Texas Law Review soon, um, the Internet of Things, a lot of these devices do not have lots of robust privacy protections. Some of them don't even address it in their terms of service. And even worse, the uh, software involved often can't be updated to perhaps address privacy problems. Okay? So this is a huge problem that we're sort of, uh, sort of heading into and I think often uh, unawares, even as the boosters of the quantified self and other entities try to encourage us to do more and more self-tracking, uh, more and more uh, efforts to track what's going on in, in our own bodies and to create permanent records of those. So the implications are pretty clear. One is, what happens if all of the big data databases, if you put them all together, if you're able to put together, say, lists of what people are buying at the grocery store, how big is their uh, clothing size, um, what sort of books are they reading about, what are their internet search searches, et cetera, to the extent that you can put together tons of this sort of information, will it render our HIPAA gains nugatory or at least severely compromise them? Okay, that's a big worry, right? Because if someone can find out or kind of attribute to me diabetic concern or something without looking at my endocrinologist's record, it doesn't really matter if I've protected that endocrinologist's record very, very strongly if the, ultimately the same effect is happening. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act kind of recognized this by having a category that not only the disabled are protected, but those sort of considered uh, in the disabled class. We need to think about that in the privacy context. Also, the example with the credit card company, I think, should lead us to think about not just brokers, right? Because think about a paradox here. If you just regulate the brokers, then you're effectively just allowing big companies, the bigger the company, to essentially, you're encouraging them to bring all this data collection in-house. So I would say if you're imposing regulation on the data brokers, hey, impose it on Target. Target's uh, sort of attributing to people uh, whether they're pregnant or not, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They're creating these sort of health attributions. So let's be ambitious here. Let's not just sort of <laughs> continually be fighting five years ago battle, 10 years ago battles, et cetera. Um, I would say finally, in terms of solutions, um, there's a lot of emphasis now on disclosure and on notice and consent. Um, my worry is that there are simply so many of these entities that it's really hard to keep track of them. Um, there was a Washington Post article on what were called fourth bureau entities a couple of years ago, like 60 or so entities that are keeping consumer records that are sort of tantamount to what credit bureaus do, a little more narrow. You know, imagine you've got, a, it's hard enough keeping track of Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. Are we really going to want to keep track of all the data of these 60 other brokers or perhaps the thousands that are feeding into um, other entities? I also think that, um, so therefore, I hope that we're going to see more emphasis on two things. One would be use restrictions. You know, just trying to ensure that in very sensitive areas of life, employment, credit, landlords, education, other sorts of environments, that this type of data just isn't used and that we really emphasize trying to audit, making sure that the data isn't used. Um, I also think that we need to, as a general matter, distinguish between uses of data that are innovation, that are actually producing and, and enhancing productivity, enhancing people's well-being, versus uses of data that are discrimination. I would submit that many of the things that are touted as innovation, if you really scratch the surface, are forms of discrimination. So with that, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, good morning, thank you. My name is uh, Kirk Nahr. I'm a lawyer uh, here in Washington with Wiley Ryan, and I have a little bit of a sense that it, uh, I'm a designated punching bag today since my, uh, my clients are basically the industry in this area. And so what I was asked to do was to talk a little bit about um, 
how some of the issues that we're talking about in this panel today do affect the, the companies that are either regulated or are not regulated, but how they're, how it's affecting their issues, what they're dealing with, what they're seeing, where these, where these rules are creating problems for them. Um, and I want to set the stage a little bit. I mean, I, to following up on what, what Nick started with, the HIPAA rules do whatever they do where they apply. I mean, we can have a debate about that. That's not really, I think, the purpose of today's discussion. But I think everybody would agree that the scope of HIPAA has never really made that much sense. It wasn't written as a privacy law. It was written as a law that started out dealing with portability. It was a law that then moved on to standardized electronic transactions. And so you had these scope choices that no one would have made if you started from a privacy perspective. It makes no particular sense to say that a health insurer has to follow one set of rules, but if you get in an automobile accident and you turn in your medical records to two different insurers, one auto insurer and one health insurer, there's two different sets of rules because you don't take your auto insurance coverage with you from employer to employer. It made no sense to say that your rights as an individual, again, we can debate whether they're good or bad, but whatever rights you had depended on the accident of how your doctor billed. If the doctor happened to bill on paper, you got no rights. That just didn't make any sense. So that's a premise of where we're starting from. I think that the recent changes to these rules that brought the service providers into the reach of HIPAA, again, there's a lot of positives to that, but I think it's made some, some of the ambiguities and confusion even stronger and made it even more significant. And at the same time, while we've all recognized that there were gaps in the HIPAA scope, those gaps, and that's really the focus, I think, of today's session, have grown enormously. We used to have small gaps. You had the, the insurers, you had auto insurers, you had workers' comp, you had doctors who happened to bill on paper. But you know there was a relatively limited list. Now we've got this expansion of health information to dozens, hundreds, thousands of kinds of activities that we just didn't have at that point in time. And so the percentage of of sort of in HIPAA and out of HIPAA of health information has changed a lot. So let me try to focus just quickly on, I think, three different categories of the industry. And again, it's a little hard to characterize it because it covers such a range of businesses. But for covered entities, those businesses that are really the, the centerpiece of what's protected by HIPAA. Um, Obviously, the scope lines have mattered even for those companies. You have, you know, every every hospital is also an employer, and so every hospital is providing, you know, healthcare benefits to their employees. You know, you have to act differently. You have insurance companies that were in and out of different product lines. They have always had challenges of how to deal with data about people, some of which was regulated, some of which wasn't regulated. A hospital obviously is going to, you know, the the, the overwhelming percentage of their data is going to be patient data fully protected by these rules, but they've had to figure out how to structure their business to deal with these other pieces. One of the developments we've had for all of those covered entities is that they now have access to more and more sources of information about people. Again, we can debate whether that's good or bad. It, it is a fact at this point that is not particularly coming to them because these people are patients. And so one of the challenges is how to integrate all of that information in terms of operating your business. Um, one of the uh, sort of oddities of HIPAA's scope in, in a broad sense is that HIPAA actually protects lots of data about people that isn't actually about their health. I mean, for example, your name and address, if you're a patient, is clearly protected as HIPAA data. If I could find the same information in the phone book, it's not protected as HIPAA data. But if I happen to have it because uh, uh, you know, you're a hospital or you're a health insurer, it's protected. So they've got all these challenges of trying to bring in um, information from sources that aren't what we think of as HIPAA sources, but it's going to wrap it in and it's going to create challenges in terms of information security, in terms of marketing practices, in terms of business, business development practices. It's happening. It's causing a lot of confusion. And again, this is not to, to, to say this is a good or a bad thing. I'm just stating some facts about what's affecting these companies. It's creating lots of concerns when there are, in fact, things like security breaches, trying to figure out which of the multiplicity of rules would be applicable to certain kinds of data. You have to track where it's coming from, how it played out, what kind of information it was, et cetera. There also certainly are competitive issues because you have companies who are inside the scope of HIPAA who have to deal with a particular set of rules and companies who may be doing exactly the same thing who happen to be outside the line don't have to follow those principles. 
that's almost the the easiest piece though those are the people that are that are front and center on hipaa the covered entities i think the business associates the service providers have an additional and and, and very significant challenge and i think that um the, 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 the changes to the HIPAA rules that brought these service providers in the scope of HIPAA was generally a positive development. I think that's a, a positive development on privacy and on security for that matter. It doesn't change some of the complications for those entities, particularly businesses who have health care as a, as a piece of what they're doing, but it's not, you know, it's not like a hospital most of what they're doing. And so what we're seeing is having these companies try to figure out how to adjust their business structure because some some part of their business operations are covered by this very particular set of rules and the rest of their business again not because they're doing anything wrong but the rest of their business isn't covered by that so that's a real challenge I think it's creating issues with who you do business with who your clients are who your customers are who's up and down your chain and again that 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 contracting dilemma has become a real business challenge um, I want to take the next step to go to companies that are generally outside of HIPAA, and there were a couple of references um, both in this panel and then in the earlier presentation to some of these companies, particularly with the Data Palooza event that was going on earlier this week. Um, obviously, there are an enormous range, there's an enormous range of companies that are building products to deal with information that would be broadly characterized as healthcare information. It may not be your specific medical records of your surgery, but it's information about your fit your your weight your your behavior etc and so what we are seeing and I think I would agree with some of the characterizations that were made earlier is that privacy privacy first security second and maybe a little less but um, is not getting a lot of attention in building those products and I would say that it's actually a, a, a function of both what the government's trying to encourage in the sense that they want products to work and so they're the focus is on getting the products to work without necessarily factoring in these other pieces. But what I'm seeing is it's actually a real missed opportunity for a lot of these companies because what we're seeing is that they're building products to do whatever they do and then later they're sort of realizing that they have to think about this odd regulatory structure we have. And I've actually had a number of, of companies that I've worked with who have built these great products and then realize that their major business opportunities are with companies who are inside the scope of this HIPAA product and all of a sudden they have to make a series of choices that they really didn't want to have to make and they hadn't thought about it. And so they're missing opportunities by not factoring privacy and security into their initial design and their initial uh, strategy. So it's both a technology issue and I think a business strategy issue. Uh, you know, the fact that we've got this divide between inside of HIPAA and outside of HIPAA forces companies to really think about how they're going to structure their business in a way that deals with both of those pieces and permits them to make those choices going forward. So. Um, let me stop there again. We, we, I'm happy to, to talk about any of these issues during the question period, but you know, I think the multiplicity of rules and the fact that we have businesses and information, some of which is in and some of which is out, is creating real ongoing practical challenges across the, the, the broadest definition of what we call the healthcare industry. Thank you. Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine Serks with the Doctor Patient Medical Association. Um, first of all, I, I just wouldn't be me if I didn't disagree immediately off the top with something that's been said, and that is I'm going to disagree with our, with our respectfully with our distinguished moderator, um, who said that we've been that uh, that HIPAA has protected most things most of the time, and I would have to say off the bat that we've been led to believe that HIPAA fixes everything or protects most things most of the time, but m many of us would contend that that's just not so. Um, the, the HIPAA was not designed to protect it. It was designed to, it, it, we, and, it, and the problem is that we have eliminated the patient consent. So HIPAA is not the, the fix-all that, that many people have portrayed it to be. So then we're getting into to where, what we're doing here now is looking at the area of where HIPAA doesn't apply. And I would contend that maybe it doesn't make that much difference in terms of actually protecting consumer privacy. And maybe we have actually better opportunities where HIPAA doesn't apply in the marketplace to do something about it. But let me take a look at the landscape. I'm speaking from the, from the physician 
medical professional and the patient side. I'm trying to bring the consumer side to this for you. So <clears throat> I'm trying to speak in terms of what consumers want and what consumers' perspectives are. I've, I sat in many hearings and testified at hearings up at HHS while HIPAA was being implemented and while the rules were being written. Um, Bob Gelman, and I don't know if Bob is, is here, but you mentioned Bob Gelman. Um, Bob Gelman actually sat on the committee for National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics that worked to develop and, and, rec and advise the Secretary of HHS on the rules. Um, I can tell you from sitting and testifying in those meetings, no one remotely anticipated the landscape that we have now and the proliferation of the mobile apps. Because at the time, as you mentioned, that it was about the medical record, the, the EHR and what was coming with the, with the, with the um, medical records used in a clinical and, and payment the TPO, basically. But now we have something completely different. What are we talking about? Well, the mobile apps, and we, you've touched on this. Mobile apps, we have fitness mobile apps. Um, we have more than, right now we have, a, a, I, I, I gave up counting at about 12,000 mobile apps in the Play Store that relate to healthcare. Fitness apps, my baby record, my gym record, my blood pressure record, my glucose record, the eating disorder manager. My symptoms, pill and medication reminders, uh, that tells a lot about you, that you get into those. Many of these, by the way, are developed and run for uh, for-profit companies that have some other marketing interest. Not just, I'm going to do a startup and do something to help people remind them about their prescriptions, but I'm a drug manufacturer, I want to know what drugs they are taking. Or I'm Playtex, and I will develop the period tracker app. And then I can start to get information about women. I am Nike, and I run the Nike training app. What do I do with all that information that I collect? OK, so that's mobile apps. That's how far we have mobile apps. We have cloud storage. Um, in general, cloud storage. It could be medical records, it could be non-medical records, but it's all sitting in clouds and, and, and being used. We have the personal health records. Um, people are using, the, the increasing di um, dynamically, the number of people using personal health records, and of course that is not HIPAA protected. We have people doing genealogical research. And this has become a very big issue because of the genetic information <clears throat> that is now available. We have the genealogical um, and the genetic information websites. Uh, we have <clears throat> just workplace wellness programs. I got one, I was at a conference a couple weeks ago, and this is the American Federation of Teachers, and they're setting up an in-house wellness program, but they are looking at Hypertension, they want to know your, they, they're, they're keeping track of your, um, your A1C, diabetes alert, diabetes alert, coronary artery disease, are you taking an ACE inhibitor, et cetera. That's the list. This is an in-house list. This is an in-house wellness program that the employer has access to, and this is not HIPAA protected because it's not medical records. We have um, plain old shopping. And as you intimated, there are things like when you buy clothes online, they can track whether you're buying in a bigger size or not now. And they know that you've gained weight. If you're buying maternity clothes, there are many, many ways that they have to extrapolate data that becomes meaningful for that body score that, that, you, that you mentioned. Health information websites. And on shopping, I want to mention too, is that even if you don't shop online, many people um, about 25% of people do their research online before they go into a bricks and mortar store. So even if you're not ordering the packages, many people do. We all, many, and I think that number's low at this point. Um, health information websites, WebMD, et cetera. When you do a web search on diabetes, you, you can become that, that person who is, dia is di diabetic concerned. So <clears throat> the problem we have here is that they can extrapolate the information. Pew says that 80% that of people are doing health information online. So what do we have here? The parties are the consumers. The consumers, let me sum up by talking about the attitudes here. The parties of the consumers is somewhat schizophrenic because everybody says they want privacy 
and they want security. Um, the um, co the um, Consumer action, you're going to hear from Michelle tomorrow, I believe. Consumer action sa you know, has numbers that show very high desirability for, for, for privacy. However, when it comes down to paying a dollar for that app or getting it for free, People go with the free app so many times, so what do we do when they tell us that they want privacy? 95% um, of people don't want it shared or so sold, but that's exactly what they're doing is giving it away. They think they have protections that they don't have. And then the problem on the other side is the developers. Do we have any developers here, software developers, vendors? I went to a conference of developers and they really, there was really, I can tell you, there was no concern. They were told, this is not about fairness, this is a business. And that was what we were told um, at that conference. So what do we do? Do we regulate or do we educate? I think that's the question to throw out. Um, currently, what we do in terms of regulation is usually we try to do things about security breaches, which is almost useless once your security is breached or your information's out there. But the problem, again, that I want to emphasize as we're talking, I think we'll talk some more about solutions as we get into discussion. What I want to emphasize is that the information goes out in ways that people don't know. The consumers are starting to get this, but they don't know the extent of it. One company I know is, is creating an independent network of doctors. They're using the right brain thinking, and so they're asking potential patients, they're looking for compliant patients, not necessarily the most healthy, but compliant patients. They're asking questions that don't even have to do with their medical record to get at this, the heart of this. So this is so, um, so it's, it's just pervasive into everything we do, and patients really need to understand how their information is used and the transparency of where their data is going. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, even though you forgot the rule that Kirk was the punching bag, not the chair. Um, <laughs> Andrea, a more complex introduction for you. <laughs> thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today, and I thank the organizers and Nick for inviting me. Um, I must, unfortunately, start with a disclaimer. So I'm currently wearing multiple hats. Uh, I'm a law professor teaching at the Warden School at the University of Pennsylvania, and I have a bunch of other affiliations, including the Stanford Law School Center for Internet and Society. But right now, I'm also serving as the Federal Trade Commission's uh, senior policy advisor on privacy and security. But in my capacity here today, although I will discuss um, briefly some of the Federal Trade Commission's uh, important enforcement actions and positions generally in this area, I'm wearing the academic hat. And so I strongly disclaim <laughs> all the words that are about to flow from my mouth represent my opinions as an academic and sh should not be attributable to the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, <laughs> and many of the opinions I'm about to express already exist in writing in my scholarship. And so there's no mystery as to what I think anyway. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd, uh, I look forward to our questions and our conversation, and in that vein, to stimulate the discourse around possible policy approaches and solutions and how various agencies, perhaps, can play an important role in mitigating pieces of the difficult multifaceted puzzle that we've seen unfurled before you today by various panelists. I'd like to speak briefly about some of the activity of the Federal Trade Commission in this area at the request of my uh, genteel moderator. Uh, and so the Federal Trade Commission, as many of you undoubtedly know, is concerned simultaneously with consumer protection and competition policy. In particular, in the consumer protection space, the Federal Trade Commission seeks out fraudulent, deceptive, or unfair trade practices and seeks to provide information to consumers in particular to help spot, stop, and avoid engaging with these types of products and services. The Federal Trade Commission has put out numerous reports that uh, are consumer facing with respect to medical identity theft. The agency has brought actions against, for example, a cancer testing lab recently where patient data was exposed on a peer-to-peer -peer network. 
the agency has run conferences focused on consumer-generated health information, and uh, those conferences are available online for your viewing pleasure at your convenience. Uh, and recently, also, there was an enforcement action against an Android flashlight app that promised acne cures. Simply by holding your phone up to your face, it's magic. <laughs> and as you might suspect, uh, the product did not work as promised, uh, hence the enforcement activity. And most recently, perhaps, the FTC published, just within the last week or so, uh, an extensive report on data brokers, which I encourage all of you to read, because uh, the concerns that have been uh, articulately um, set forth before you by my co-panelists are certainly within the scope of the report and its considerations. I'd like to pull out this conversation one step back, and perhaps the value add that I might be able to bring to this panel is putting the conversation in broader context within the activities of the technology business community more broadly, and in particular, the privacy and information security concerns that are becoming progressively more prominent and highlighted by both consumers, the media, and uh, generally in our society. One of the recent FTC enforcement actions that the information security community, at least, is viewing with um, uh, interest, and v some members of the community view as a watershed moment from the standpoint of enforcement activity, is a recent enforcement action uh, against a company called TrendNet, where a set of internet-enabled cameras uh, were marketed with promises that the transmissions were secure, but in reality, reasonable data security practices did not exist in the transmissions, and so individuals could access internet-based feeds into children's bedrooms, houses, et cetera. So whether my child's, my hypothetical child's, sleeping patterns are a bit of health information, whether my child's current mm -hmm. flu is health information, as purveyed by an internet-enabled camera that did not demonstrate reasonable security in place and might allow for an attacker to remotely monitor this. These are the types of questions that are not strictly speaking construed as health data privacy and security questions, but yet we intuitively sense that they do implicate these concerns as well. And so in my last one minute and 40 seconds, I'm going to leave you, if I may, with a few themes that I would enjoy hearing commentary from my co-panelists and from the audience. What I'm seeing, having sort of tracked this space of private security for over a decade now, is this movement of uh, what I might call a better with bacon model. So there's a joke in the information security community that everything is better with bacon and Bluetooth, and that we're building technology capabilities onto devices that don't really need them. And so we're building them because we can, not because we should. And so this idea of getting a product to work, including these ethical and legal considerations of responsible innovation. So innovation not for the sake of innovation, but innovation for the sake of improving individuals' lives, consumers' lives, medical care, et cetera. Um, so this better with bacon problem. Also, the division between privacy and security, it's not a clean line. And we've theorized privacy aggressively in the legal community, so I'll, I'll blame us on this one. We've theorized uh, privacy extensively in the legal community, but information security, data security, we've really under-theorized. And the conversation around consent is in part problematized because of this under-theorizing. So, um, one of the tensions that I see happening right now, and this will be my final point, is that the ability of consumers to understand what they're consenting to is progressively eroded by emerging technologies. There's, right now in the press, a conversation around, for example, a TV set, a smart TV set, that post-purchase allegedly pushed out an amendment to the end user license agreement and a firmware update 
that modified the microphone settings on the TV to collect more data about the voice interactions mm. of the consumers in the room. Mm. So if you're discussing your current illness at that time, Yikes. perhaps your TV is also collecting that information. And so this question of what constitutes health connected or health information is becoming progressively more complex and not necessarily apparent in this world of the internet of things. And meanwhile, on the other hand, the reality of the costs of encryption dramatically lower than they ever were before. And so the excuses of not encrypting data are going away by the minute. And I'll leave it there, and I look forward to conversation. Well, thank you. The, uh, the panel is now open for your questions and reactions. Otherwise, I'll have to ask questions. Adrian. Hi. Uh, Adrian Grau for Patient Privacy Rights. Uh, it's uh, 41 years since uh, Willis Ware published uh, the uh, fair information practice, uh, at least the one I, I consider the first uh, comment about technology and fair information practice. It seems that in the, in the big data debate that is going on so furiously now, and that includes the Internet of Things uh, in that, uh, fair information practice is nowhere to be found. Uh, it, in effect, uh, one reading of the PCAST report uh, is that they're kind of uh, throwing fair information practice under the bus. Uh, not completely, but uh, in that direction, certainly. Uh, so uh, from this learned panel on this topic, it, is, fair information is it time for fair information practice to come back in this 40 years later, second generation, and, and uh, structure? the kind of legal changes that you're implying, Nick, in his original uh, introduction and the rest of you? Or is it passe? Is it just 40 years ago? And would you include, Adrian, in fair information practices, data minimization? So Absolutely. Yeah. Notification, what I'm saying is, and, and the issue about security and privacy, I think, is also in there. Uh, uh, you know, I consider uh, consent for a specific purpose notice and minimization to be the elements, the clear elements of what is, and then security is the wrapper that enables those. But it, it, talking about fair information practice in, in all of these things yeah. enables us to first focus on minimization as reflected in meaningful choice or consent, and then the notice and the transparency that, that do the audit piece that was mentioned earlier. Right. Oh gosh, on the spot. Okay, um, I I just I think that one of the ideas that I I want to put out there, and I, I would agree with you. I think that the FIPS should be back in the picture with respect to a lot of this material, and I want to say also there is an alliance that could be made also between privacy advocates and those who are about reproducibility and validity of science. Um, if you look at Tim Harford's uh, big article in the FT about the problems of big data, some of the critiques of Google flu trends, etc., um, they indicate concern that if you don't know the provenance of the data that's going into your data set, then you may not be able to uh, sort of know if, if the results are valid. So I think that that is a potential alliance. Um, and I'll let our other speakers. Yeah, I think the, the, the problem, and this, I think that, Adrian, you've set up the problem, though, of regulation versus, versus the um, market, uh, market control within itself, the market coming up with best practices. Because when we regulate fair practice or regulate best practices, what we have is unfortunately um, things like the High Tech Act requiring that personal health records have um, a, no, a duty to disclose a breach. And m my concern is that something like that doesn't do consumers much good in advance, that we want to focus on before. And I think that there is an opportunity um, because if we, if, we, if we take a focus of best practice, you're, using, you're, you're going back to fair, fair practice, the, the, the act. But if we take an approach of a best practice, maybe that's you know 2.0 on the on the FIPS, um, that we can get the developers in the marketplace to actually do meaningful protections and meaningful disclosure to consumers in a way that'll be that'll be necessary. I mean, what I'm looking at is that that 
the the PA, the PHRs, the companies that do PHRs are required to have best practices right now under regulations, but they're but they're things like answering questions like what happens if my vendor goes out of business or is sold? And most people read that and that's meaningless to them. That's not meaningful disclosure or information to consumers. Kirk, you wanted to jump in. Oh, I, I was just gonna say, I mean, I guess I don't view the fair information practices as something that we're not using at this point. I don't know that that always means they're done effectively, but I think that the principles that are in fair information practices show up not only in you know, some element of every law that we've seen. I mean, again, you can debate whether you like the result or not, um, but I think they're in, in the laws. I think they're the core principles. Um, I think there's there's certainly an ongoing debate as to whether they are necessarily principles that continue to make sense. I mean, for example, the idea of notice, I think everybody agrees that the idea of notice is a good general principle, but I think we also probably all agree that the notice documents and the notice, in, there, there's so much information in these notices that it's essentially a pointless right at this point. You, you, you have the right to know about all kinds of things that you're never actually going to know anything about. And so it's a, li it's a little bit of a, a split. I think the other principle, and this is maybe where the big data idea runs up most directly against the HIPAA principle is the idea of data minimization, which is, I mean, big data is clearly an idea of take everything and figure out what you're going to do later. And healthcare, at least as a principle, is sort of the opposite of that, at least the HIPAA rules are. And so I think that's a real tension. And I'm not sure it's a, um, I'm not sure that you want to pick either extreme of those, but I do think it's that it's something we have to give a lot of thought to how this is going to play out. Um, you know, again, there's just, I, I guess, and I, I can't remember who said this earlier, someone talked about sort of use limitations, I think it was your friend, you know, I think that's actually a really important part of this, because I think that in a lot of these businesses, and, and including these new technologies, I don't know that there are people that are, that are setting out to do creepy things. Maybe your example with the cameras and the voice. I mean, that's, that's, that's obviously a creepy thing and a sneaky thing. I think a lot of it is other times people are trying to do something pretty straightforward and then they find out they have information that might be useful for something else. So I think we do have to be a little careful with that as well. One quick question. One quick. No, uh, so just to, to follow up, I think uh, any next iteration of these conversations around frameworks, best practices, et cetera, uh, would uh, benefit from this reframing around responsible innovation and thinking about, echoing some of the concerns from my co-panelists, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, both in the code and in the information itself. Just one sort of quick thought from me about sort of regulatory or pre-regulatory noise. Um, over the last what, four years, we've had the White House report on privacy before the election, the FTC report. We've had now two White House, well, White House influenced big data pieces. We've had the FTC data brokers thing, but there's maybe more from the FTC to come. And yet there isn't really a common theme running through any of those. So it, it's quite hard to... To, to actually start con having concrete uh, uh, thoughts, Adrian, about uh, uh, what kind of, of models to, to follow. And I think that's, that's a part of the, the, the problem for stakeholders at the moment. There's an awful lot of noise in the signal. Next question, please. I'm David Smith. I'm with the Institute. And I'm in kind of a skitzy situation because I've been a software developer for 40 years. And for the last 25 years, I've been uh, consulting with the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment on privacy and security issues. So I'm kind of interested in both. And I want to bring up two thoughts that, that, I, that you're the previous presenters uh, gave me, and I think they may, they're related, and I think they may be of some issue, some interest, and they may just fall on the floor, but I'll get to say them. Uh, Sahib was talking about how uh, privacy doesn't get built in at the very beginning of a software development project. And what is of interest to the customer gets built in from the beginning. And I think a significant issue for all of us is almost all the way down the line, we as patients are never the customer. We aren't the customer who buys the health record system. We aren't the, the hospital's customer. 
Occasionally, we may be the doctor's customer, but that kind of doctor isn't buying a, a big electrical yeah. uh, a EPR system, and he's certainly not involved in the definition. So I think there's a structural issue that's going to be banging into us all along that we have no standing in the design of the systems. And, and Dr. Allen brought up the ethical responsibility that we have of protecting our systems. And we need to realize that all of those apps in the mobile world, we aren't the customer. We're the product. When we install them yes. on our system, we are not being ethically responsible. And we need, when we're doing these searches, if we care, if we're being ethically responsible about who finds out about what we're interested in, and we're not using something like the Tor browser, which hides us, if we're using Google, and Google can easily find out about us, if we're using Internet so let's, Explorer. So let's take the, the, the mobile That's, uh, you get the and, point. And, 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 and let the panel play that out. Is, is, is mobile a very different type of issue compared to uh, maybe big data and big data brokers that, that we actually might want to pull apart and deal with somewhat separately? I mean, I guess, you know, m m mobile, mobile is only different in, from my perspective. I mean, I think, it, I think it does change who the customer is a little bit in the sense that, um, you know, most of the apps are targeted to people as people. And I think that if you don't have a, an appeal to them, you're not, you're not going to get that. I think the challenge is, you know, and, and, and this is something that, that we face, and it, it's, it's obviously a, a big issue in healthcare. It's not only an issue. Uh, it's not only an issue in healthcare, which is you've got so many opportunities to give people things and have them do things quickly, and you know, for these little purposes. And then we're finding out all this other stuff you can do with it on the back end. I mean, I don't know that you know so, something. Something that's going to be a calorie counter. I mean, th th that's that. There's a straightforward, basic purpose to that the problem is not offering a calorie counter. It's what's going to happen when that calorie counter data is then something else happens to that. If it's, you know, if, if all that happens is the developer looks at that and says, well, oh, you know, we're doing a bad job with people who are doing this or doing that and they build a better product, nobody cares that much about that, I suspect. It's when that information then flows out to, you know, an insurance company who's going to decide or, 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 you know, or you tie into um, weight loss and it's, you know, th those are the problems. It's not the, it's not the app itself. Now, a security breach is a different issue, I suppose. Nobody's in favor of security breach. Is right. I mean, there are a lot. There, there clearly are companies who want to push the envelope on privacy. I don't think any company wants to have a security breach. There's no upside to that. That doesn't mean they've put enough time and energy and money into building good security. But nobody wants to have a security breach. I mean, that that may be the only benefit of those breach notifications. In a lot of situations, is not that there's anything a patient can do, but that there's an embarrassment factor that you're trying to avoid it. And therefore, you know. so it, it said the, the mobile is 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 a is an example. But I don't really think it's any more than an example. Well, and he's the per he was the, per the next question because we got a lot uh, a lot stacked up. Uh, th thank you very much. My name is Albert Dane, and I'm uh, trying to um, uh, find out what your thoughts are about two new developments announced this week. I noticed there's a lot of Apple users in the room. <laughs> Could you all please uh, raise your hand if you have an Apple device? Hi, you're proud. Now, well, leave it up, leave it up for a second, please. Can you now? Uh, lower your hand if you are not going to use your Apple device to keep your health information when they roll out the new health kit they announced yesterday. Who's not? Okay. So you don't trust Apple to keep your health information, but they've just announced a health kit yeah. which for the first time will allow third-party device and app developers to not just be on the Apple ecosystem, but to communicate with each other this extensibility, the apps will be able to communicate with each other if you give them permission. And then they also announced a program already with Mayo where if a constellation of um, biomarkers on your devices indicates an acute problem, uh, the app will call Mayo, your doctor, and someone hopefully will respond to your needs immediately. Now, does anybody who lowered their hand want to put it back up now if you have that option that this health kit will automatically monitor your device and call your doctor in an emergency? Is that appealing enough? One, Great two, idea. a few? 
Okay. The other announcement so let's, 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 is Google. Let's just, Google let's, announced peer-to-peer -peer privacy let's, protection. While we're, while, we're, while we're on Apple, just okay. to, be, to be fair, even though I buy everything they make, <laughs> they actually deliver them directly to my door. I no longer order them. Um, <laughs> uh, that, that's Amazon, I think, that's delivering uh, that in advance. Yeah. Um, the Mayo opportunity, if I, I watch the keynote, um, the WWC thing, the Mayo thing, I think, is clearly covered by HIPAA. All right, uh, it's, it's a pre-existing relationship. No, no, I'm not, not, yeah, I, I, I think it's not that. I think it's not that simple. No. If what you if what you have is an Apple consumer saying, "Send my medical records to the Apple device," to that, I, I don't know that that's the Mayo piece, though. I understand, the, but, the, but, the, but, the but, but Mayo's doing it because Mayo's doing it because an Apple customer has an, is given essentially an authorization. I'm not sure that brings. I don't know. But in terms of Did what Nick is saying, right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's going to be covered by HIPAA, even that piece. But in terms of what Nick is saying, what I would think would happen, and I, I have a piece with Tara Ragone called "The Future of HIPAA in the Cloud," which covers some of the relationships between business entities and covered business associates and covered entities post high tech, is that perhaps the Apple entity could be held to many of the same HIPAA requirements as the covered entities. Um, if it's, uh, you don't think so? <laughs> FDA has already told us that consumer-facing devices are HIPAA-free, and they're going to stay that way. Yeah. The information information that comes out of them will be HIPAA bound if and when it's given to a covered entity like a doctor or an insurance plan. Well, the FDA said in the Fidesia report and also in the, the September 2013 mobile apps piece that that would not, that the kinds of things they'd be doing with in a PHR model with something like Mayo likely would not trigger immediate medical device regulation. That is distinct from what our friends at HHS OCR <laughs> might be doing. Your question, sir. Thank you. Just speak up, yeah. Shout. Yeah, okay. Um, my question was, you all kind of touched on it a little bit when you started talking about um, well, choice, first of all, and what you share and what you don't, but uh, how when you use a lot of agreements are so complicated that you can't understand it, so you basically don't have a choice. Is there any kind of work, anything that works for a plain language law that where it would say, like, you have to have, have to be written at 10th grade reading level at a certain maximum length where, you know, if you're signing your GED agreement, you know, it's just like, in the recommendations. Data, if it changes, we let you know, or you can actually understand. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky issue. I mean, I, I do a lot of work in the banking industry, and I always ask privacy audiences about people reading their privacy notices they get from the financial institutions. And hardly anybody's ever read one of those. And the FTC spent a ton of money designing a better form. But when people don't even know they got it in the mail and never started to read it, the problem isn't what the form looks like. It's that they never paid any attention to it. And so it's a, it's a tricky area. And the more you get... I mean, I, the, the HHS regs, I, that's one of the few things I, I really hate about the HIPAA regs is the privacy notice rule because HHS basically forced companies to put all kinds of things that are never going to happen in the privacy notices to almost guarantees that they're not usable. Rather than focusing on the things that is 99% of what goes on in the healthcare industry, you've got pages of all this stuff that happens one in a million times. And I just think that was a bad decision. I think it's very hard to do, though. Frank? I think that... Um, I think the hope for the future here actually might lie in the computation of the legal agreements. Like Travis Bro's group at Carnegie Mellon is trying to work on ways in which people could somehow uh, have their programs set to process the language within privacy policies. So I think that the you're going to need. I don't think that you could really explain to people in in this sort of plain language type of way all the possibilities of what could happen, <laughs> especially if you look at the results of Latanya Sweeney's work and, and the Collusion app and others that show runaway data, data that we really don't know where it's going or how it's being used in some ways. So, yeah. Andrew. Yeah, and I would suggest that that is one of the basic things that consumers are asking for is, is the transparency, that they have a right to transparency to know what the practices are and how their data will be used, except as everybody's pointing out, sometimes they don't know at the time that, that they're signing that agreement how it will be used. Andrew? I think highlighting this issue is a real value add. And for example, the Securities and Exchange Commission has taken a plain language approach to disclosure and prospectuses. So it's a value add. We got room for like one 30 second question. OK. Um, I have a quick story I want to share. I had a baby in January. Um, <laughs> And shortly thereafter, I got an email from a former employer um, who said, hey, I got a package sent to the office um, offering you some baby formulas or something you want to tell me. Um, this employer I worked with seven years yep. ago. Um, completely um, 
I don't think I ever consented to anyone to let a former employer know that I was pregnant nor expecting a child nor given birth to a child. And then the, just the second piece I want to add, um, just to put out there what we're really up against here, IBM, their CEO was on CNBC two weeks ago and said that their data analytics division was a $16 billion money maker for the company. $16 billion. Andrew, so, that I mean, sounds like a... Uh, uh, where do we go? Possible <laughs> agency-ish sort of question when people act like that? Well, what, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a big business, right? There's nothing inherently wrong with being a big business. It's what are they doing? You know, data analytics, I mean, data analytics is very useful. That doesn't have anything to, I mean, that doesn't automatically, it, 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 if, if what I can do, and I, and I always use this in the sort of underwriting context, everybody's data put together makes all the financial models better. I don't care if it's you or you or you or you, you know, so the data analytics business, again, that, that on its own, that's just a fact. It's not a, it's not a good or a bad. If they're using it for health purposes, they should be regulated like covered entities under HIPAA, I think. So I think this gets us back to the question of what is responsible innovation and that we need to have an active social conversation around the big picture of all of these data uses and business models. So as the, we enter the last three minutes of this, because I have timekeeping is very important, um, I promised each member of the panel a, a sort of 45-second uh, close of, of one thing that you would like to see done or uh, some initiative. Uh, Catherine, quickly. Uh, well, I start out saying that, I, that every software app that I know has actually been developed with the intention of collecting data, that they find a way to you, to to come up with something that will absolutely collect data, because that's how they can do it for free. So we have a problem here of how do we monetize from the, their, their perspective, how is it gonna be monetized? Is it gonna be monetized by paying for the app and, and then selling less or not? What would you want so, to the que so, the, so the solution would, one of the solutions I think would be is that we, we look at the issue of re-identification is that we have stronger protection on re-identification, and we have to have some sort of, I would suggest, a real-time notification to consumers of where their data is going and how it's being used, Cut. so that people can make those choices in real time as they go along, instead of signing off some broad. Uh, I, I think that you know the focus of our discussion today was on sort of data outside of HIPAA. I think we we do need rules that cover the health, the information more broadly. I would certainly favor. Um, I would favor broader but simpler. I think one of the challenges we have in the healthcare industry is that there's just too many rules. There's, a, you know, yeah. you, you actually can't figure out what all the rules across the country are and all these things. I would rather have, I mean, I say this all the time, a little facetiously, but give me one law that covers everything. I don't even care what it says. Give me the one law so then we can all figure out what to do with that. <laughs> Um, within the data sphere, I would say that the necessary first step for all future regulation is verifying the provenance of all data and keeping track of all entities to which the data is sold and having that, and that material being audited by the FTC or some other competent agency in the same way that ONC or other HHS is auditing for health privacy practices. I would say also we should consider taxation of this industry given all of the harms that it is now creating and will eventually be creating. And I would finally say that use restrictions restrictions outside of the data sphere are essential because more likely than not, aggressive interpretations of the First Amendment are going to vitiate those other, the last two things I just said. Thanks. Andrew. One of the initial pieces of this puzzle includes redefining what it means for a product to work, to include privacy and security from the ground up by design, and for businesses to redefine self-perception around their entities being organized for their own benefit around end-to-end -end information management in responsible ways with good security practices. And my last word is, Dr. Peel, you're amazing, and it's 10.50. <laughs>